Hello, and welcome to another exciting episode of FHEO's Table Talk series. I am your host, Deandra Cullen. The Table Talk series was created to foster unwavering partnerships with trusted voices of the community. I'm talking about those voices who speak for people with lived experiences. We want to listen, but we also want to learn. April is National Fair Housing Month. This year, we pause to celebrate the 54th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act. It is a moment when we remind ourselves that law, this law, is more than just words. It is a charge for action, which results in greater equity for all. We must work together to fulfill the purpose and true meaning of the word fair as embodied in this landmark law. Today's episode explores the intersection between our work in fair housing in the federal sector and the fair housing work done within the walls of higher education. Educators and law practitioners of Howard University in Washington, D.C. are here with me today to highlight the critical role the university's fair housing clinic plays in developing the next generation of fair housing and civil rights advocates, scholars, and lawyers. The Fair Housing Clinic serves as a pillar in the nation's capital. It provides legal services to the underserved while developing students' practical skills in legal careers and public service. Today, I have the honor of speaking with Okemer Christian Dark, Associate Provost for Faculty Development in the Office of the Provost for Howard University and she's a professor of law at the university. I am also joined by Valerie Schneider, professor of law and the director of the Clinical Law Center at Howard University School of Law. Last, but certainly not least, is Asiola Sankara, former student attorney of the Fair Housing Clinic. Thank you all for joining me today to have this especially important conversation about the importance of engaging institutions of higher learning in policy discussions about racial equity in underserved communities. Especially when you consider that these schools are preparing future generations of community advocates, legal scholars, and policy makers. There's enough room at our table for all of these voices. Let's begin this conversation with you, Professor Dark. You know all too well how harmful housing discrimination can be. You experienced rejection of an application for an apartment simply because of the color of your skin. Let's look at a clip from your documentary entitled Housing Discrimination. Who should ever have to get used to that? I located an apartment that was relatively near the law school. It sounded like the right kind of apartment in terms of satisfying my needs. And it had the right price. I called the manager and the manager told me that I should come by and see it. The manager told me that there were two earlier inquiries, both students at our law school. One student I knew because he was in my class. That evening, my student called me. He had just spoken with the manager and she asked him if I was black or white. He told her, she's black, but what difference does that make? And she told him, I don't rent those people, those kind of people. When I received that telephone call, I had a lot of feelings. There was a sense of loss. Somehow I had lost part of myself. The only thing that seemed to be there was my skin. 
color. So I felt like I had lost a lot. And then I felt very angry. Oh, I was very angry. Professor Dark, can you take us back to that moment when you were told that the color of your skin was the reason you were denied that apartment near the law school where you worked? Yes, I certainly can, even though it has been many years. Um, I received a call from one of my students, and he had had the conversation with the landlady. Uh, he called me because he was deeply concerned about what she was asking. And when she asked the question whether she was black or not, she was asking about me. And he said, well, yes, she is. But what difference does that make? And she made it clear that it made all the difference. I can't rent to her. I can't rent to those kind of people. And I remember when I heard him repeat what she said, that it was as though I had left my body. Um, and that's all that was there, really, was who I am, the kind of person I am, the fact that I was a law professor, the things that I had achieved, um, the, none of that was relevant. Um, just this body that was black, and black in a way that she found abhorrent was there. Um, I remember having to shake myself back into sort of the presence because uh, in speaking to my student, he was apologizing. I realized he was apologizing to me for having to, to even participate in the conversation. He was so upset. And of course, this is a white student. Um, and that's why she chose him. Uh, and I found myself trying to reassure him that nothing she said at all reflected on him. He was not the person who had violated the law. He was not the person who had discriminated against me. Um, and it was, um, there was a mix of feelings. I was angry, I was upset, I was lost, I was feeling like I had gone back in time, because uh, this is Richmond, Virginia, and so I'm feeling like I've lost all these rights, I'm not even a person anymore, I'm property. Um, so it was a lot of different feelings. Uh, and in my experience as an assistant U.S. attorney, uh, where I ended up handling housing discrimination cases, anytime I, I could, I could uh, anytime I spoke with someone who was a victim of housing discrimination, you could see the impact that it was really having on them. Um, one time I spoke with a woman who all she, she, every time she talked about what happened, she shook. She was like she was shaking herself to, to, to steady herself because she could not handle the discrimination. I want, um, why, I'm sorry, I, did, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to, um, one question I wanted to ask you. Um, you mentioned that you had been representing um, clients who had similar issues. Um, I want to, if you don't mind, I want to go back to um, another clip from your documentary where you talk about the action you took as a result of the blatant discrimination that you experienced. So let's take a look at the clip for a second. Never had I suffered an insult of the magnitude that I suffered with housing discrimination. Never had I felt a need to bring a lawsuit because I had suffered an insult. The way I like to describe it, I sometimes use an illustration. If you could imagine a piece of paper, this piece of paper has all the information on it about you. It contains more information than a resume would because it has your very essence. It has information about you that you feel is so critical to who you are. 
and essentially what happened is the uh, landlord looked at that piece of paper and she didn't like the color of the paper and she crumbled it up and she threw it away and so I spent the next two years unfolding smoothing trying my best to get the creases smooth out so that the piece of paper would look almost like the piece of paper it looked before it had been tossed out. I'm still pressing that piece of paper. I'm still working on the creases. I know that it'll never be the same. But I had to bring the lawsuit for another reason. If she could do this to me, then she could do it to others. Thank you, Professor Dark. Um, you use the metaphor in the documentary of the piece of paper when you describe the impact of the discrimination you endured. Do you think that your efforts to unfold and smooth out that very piece of paper that the landlord crumbled up and threw out shaped you into the change maker you are today? Well, I think it certainly has an impact in causing me to be much more of a, um, if, as you describe, a change maker. I like to think that I was already doing that work as a professor, as a teacher. Um, but what I found is that with the fair housing, it, with this particular experience, is that I had to tell this story. I had to tell my story to as many people as I could to really get them to understand that discrimination is not something that you just get over, that it has its marks on individuals, just as it does on our society, and that we cannot tolerate it. We can't live with it. It's too, uh, because of the harms that um, uh, we not only individually experience, but also because of the harm that it caused to our community at large. And so I found myself moving outside the classroom into the community at large to try to make a difference in this work. Did you know then that you would devote your career to helping others as you've done in the various roles that you mentioned earlier uh, throughout your career? <laughs> well, like I said, I, I always thought I would be doing helping others because I'm a teacher. Um, I did not, however, expect that my story would have the impact that it has had. Um, I think mainly because people sometimes with um, when you uh, when people encounter a story around discrimination, they find ways to blame the victim. Uh, well, they really couldn't have afforded the apartment or well, they had a criminal record. And that's really the reason. And with me, what, what's the reason? I could afford the apartment. I had done, I had uh, worked hard to achieve the position I was in. I wasn't, um, I didn't have a criminal record. Uh, what, what was it? What does, it was just her view of what being black meant. Yeah. And that meant that there was no excuse but to look at the unadulterated ugliness of racism. And that has helped to have the conversations that we need to have. Not blame the victim. I couldn't agree Get with you more. Get at discrimination. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and I, I, I so appreciate that conviction. Uh, you've had an illustrious career in law and advocacy, including your role, as you mentioned, at the Department of Justice as a trial lawyer and as a commissioner of the National Commission on Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity. Your career spans over three decades. Let us spend mm. some time talking about your part in the establishment of Howard University's Fair Housing Clinic almost 20 years ago. What inspired the launch of this clinic? Well, uh, we had a dean, uh, Dean Kurt Schmoke, who was very interested in expanding 
clinical opportunities for our students. Uh, and to do that in areas where we really could have a social justice impact. Um, coincidentally, we had a um, official from HUD approach us uh, about the possibility of having a clinic. And we were immediately uh, excited about that possibility. Uh, we also had a uh, director of our clinical programs at the time, uh, Tamar Meekins, the late Tamar Meekins, uh, who had an extensive background in pub as a public defender and was very socially justice minded. So let's just say all of the cards came together properly and we were able to launch that clinic. And from the beginning, we launched it with an emphasis on not just bringing the cases, which is important, and representing people who have been discriminated against under the fair housing law uh, was clearly uh, important for developing our students into future uh, lawyers in this particular area, this field. But it was also important that we get out and educate the public about the law. So there were lots of different ways that we reached out into the community. Fortunately, we've also, we now have another excellent director of that fair housing clinic, Professor Valerie Schneider. And under her leadership, we've expanded the kind of work, the different kinds of work that the students do in the clinic. So it, while it may be litigation, um, there's also policy opportunities, uh, policy development opportunities for the students as well. And uh, I've just, um, and opportunities in terms of when you look at the litigation, not just at the trial level, but they've even uh, had comment on Supreme Court case. So I, I, I think that uh, her leadership has given us the possibility of really expanding the training uh, for our students. Well, I think that's a great segue for us to introduce our next speaker and bring her to the conversation, and that is Professor Valerie Schneider. Thank you so much, Professor, for being with us today. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. You are the director of Howard University's Clinical Law Center. In this capacity, you oversee nine law clinics, including the Fair Housing Clinic. Is that correct? Nine clinics. That's right. Wow. Yes, there are nine clinics. Great. That is amazing. And yeah, they're Good. all, I have to say, all of the clinics hold a um, special place in my heart. Um, we've got clinics that are doing amazing work across um, a huge variety of social justice areas. But I came to Howard to do um, fair housing work. So the clinic has been um, incredibly important to me. It's it's why I went to law school was to do this type of work. Um, and I've really, I've been at Howard for um, a decade now. And I've really gotten to see the impact um, that our students have made, um, both locally in our community and um, nationally as well. Well, that's wonderful. And I know we wish, I wish we had time to talk about all of your nine clinics, but we do have time to talk about the Fair Housing Clinic, as you mentioned. And I'm just, it's just extraordinary to me, if I might say, that you manage so many clinics with such important mission statements. Uh, Professor Dark talked about the launch of the Fair Housing Clinic. I would like for you to talk to us about the mission of this clinic. What does this clinic do? Sure. Um, so at the Fair Housing Clinic, we really see it as a, um, as a housing justice clinic. Um, and in order to achieve housing justice, we have to take a multi-pronged um, approach. Um, and so as Professor Dark mentioned, um, we do a lot of individual client representation. So we represent, we have students who um, are, have a special permission from the courts to appear on behalf of clients even before they're members of the bar. So as they're supervised by our um, attorneys within the clinic, they can, um, uh, they can serve as student attorneys for individuals who are facing all sorts of legal problems related to their housing. So we do some housing discrimination cases, we also take on housing code violation cases, and we really see those as anti-displacement, anti-gentrification work. We do some eviction defense work. 
Um, and really it runs the gamut of, um, of types of housing justice work. And then as Professor Dark mentioned, in addition to that um, individual client representation, we do a lot of law reform work. So we testify at city council meetings. We have submitted responses um, to, uh, or public comments to um, proposed HUD rules. Um, we've submitted amicus briefs in um, appellate cases related to housing justice. We've mooted cases, Supreme Court cases, um, related to housing justice at the um, law school so that students have the opportunity to really leverage what they're learning um, with their clients on a local or national scale when they're doing law reform work. Um, and then in addition to individual client representation and law reform work, we also do a lot of education and outreach. So our goal is really to empower um, our clients to bring the microphone closer to our clients' voices and to turn that microphone into a megaphone. That's that's amazing, especially seeing that, you know, that's an area that I'm, that's very near and dear to my heart and that's education outreach. Uh, so I appreciate that. Uh, this clinic, as you mentioned, provides legal services to residents in the Washington DC area. With housing discrimination allegations based on the seven protected classes, you know, there's race and color, national origin, religion, sex, which includes sexual orientation and gender identity, uh, disability and family status. I know that there are states around the country that provide additional fair housing protections. In the District of Columbia, are there additional fair housing protections that you could talk about? Sure, there are. There, so the District of Columbia has a number of um, other protected classes in addition to the, one you, uh, the ones that you mentioned. And part of the goal of having additional protected classes is to really think about what should housing providers be allowed to consider when someone applies for housing. They should not be allowed to consider race for all of the reasons that Professor Dark just um, talked about and any of the other protected classes that are in the uh, part of the federal law. But in DC and other jurisdictions around the country, um, legislatures have said, well, there are other things that housing providers are really not relevant to, uh, the, you know, to the decisions housing providers um, are making. So, so they shouldn't be able to think about someone's political affiliation. They shouldn't be able to, to discriminate based on somebody's appearance in addition to their race. Um, and in DC and, and a few other jurisdictions, um, there's also a prohibition on considering source of income. And that means that housing providers consider, can consider to the extent it's relevant how much income a person has, but they shouldn't be able to consider where that income comes from. And the reason for that is because we find, you'll see if you look on, you know, on websites that advertise rental housing, you'll see lots of um, advertisements that say no um, uh, Section 8 voucher applicants allowed, right? And so no government support applicants allowed or, um, or income or, you know, your, your rent must come from income, not child support, not alimony, not any other source. And that really um, is a barrier to many of our clients who are seeking housing, particularly in um, environments like DC, where there's, um, there's a real affordable housing um, crisis. And so if somebody who has a Section 8 voucher gets turned away and turned away and turned away, even though they can pay for with a very, very reliable, the government is paying, paying a portion of the rent, so they have a very reliable source um, of, of income. If those doors are closed to them, we're losing, you know, part of the fabrics, uh, uh, the fabric of our communities. There's, um, you know, it displaces people out of our communities. Um, and um, there's an incredible loss there. And so one of the types of cases we see fairly frequently in the clinic is source of income um, discrimination. Thank you for that, because um, my, my next question, but you've already answered it so brilli brilliantly, and that is, you know, what does this protection mean for someone in DC who's looking for affordable homes? So I appreciate um, your response to that. You're already anticipating um, my questions, which I yeah. love. Um, can someone who, with a housing discrimination complaint come directly to the clinic for assistance, or how can someone find, get help with the uh, Fair Housing Clinic? They can. So you can look online at the um, clinic website on the on the um, law.howard.edu webpage. You can find the clinics there. Um, and there's an online form that you can fill out. Um, you can also find our intake phone number um, where you can leave a voicemail message and then very quickly you'll have a law student give you a call back. And one thing I'll say is that we get many, many more um, requests for service than we can provide in our clinical law center. But one thing we really try to do, um, and I really take this from 
um, from our former director, Tamar Meekins, is we care for each person who calls us at Howard as if they're a member of our family. So even if we don't have the capacity um, at that time to take your matter, or maybe we don't have expertise in that particular area of law, um, we really try to shepherd people who call us to a resource um, that will actually be helpful. So we try to care. I always say to students who are answering our intake calls, imagine how you would want your family member um, to be treated and please try to treat, do your best to really um, not just give somebody a phone number or a website, but shepherd them through the process if we can't help them directly. Thank you for that. Uh, why do you think the Fair Housing Clinic is so important to the community, especially now? Yeah, well, you know, that's a great question. I think there's a few reasons. One is, as I said before, our goal, the Fair Housing Clinic's goal is to bring a microphone closer to the voices of our clients. Um, and it's, you know, it's an incredibly critical time to amplify the, vo the voices of those most affected by um, housing policy. Um, and also, you know, locally here in D.C., we're in the midst of a real affordable housing crisis, and that's displacing families um, at an alarming rate. And it's such an important time to stem the tide of displacement and to hear from um, the, the families and individuals that are affected by housing policies. Um, you know, I was at a, a conference a, a while ago, and I wish I could remember the speaker who, who said this analogy because it, it um, has stuck with me. They made a great analogy to some laws of physics. So I vaguely remember from high school that there was a law of physics that objects in motion stay in motion. And in this, in this country, we've had centuries of government enforced housing discrimination. And you know that created an object in motion, a force to be reckoned with. And we can't just now take our hands off that ball. You know, we need an equal and opposite force, a force fighting for housing justice. And I really see that the housing clinic is just one small player in a huge community of housing advocates, including those um, in your office, of course, who are really working to to stop that force and push it in um, a, a different direction. And I like to think of our clinic as part of, of that story. I like that. Thank you for sharing that story. I'm going to have to use that. Um, what drives you to ensure your students have the skills and training necessary for providing legal services to underserved and marginalized uh, communities? You know, I have to admit that it's a little bit selfish because now that I've been doing this work for yeah, I'm at Howard for about a decade. I'm often now calling my former students as colleagues to ask them for advice on cases, for ask the, asking them um, for their opinions on policy initiatives and things like that. And so my some of my former students are now colleagues and mentors of um, mine. So part of it is, uh, you know, it's selfish. Um, and you know, I, I do this work because working with Howard students is the greatest fun and the greatest honor I can imagine in my career. Um, each year I learn as much from my students, um, I think, as they do from me. And one of the really rewarding parts of the clinic is seeing students make a you know, career-long commitment to um, housing justice advocacy, whether they focus their entire career on that. So we've got students who work at, in DC at the Office of the Tenant Advocate. We have students in federal agencies at Legal Aid, um, all sorts of legal services providers here in DC um, and across the um, country. And then we have other students who, you know, work for firms doing other types that the, their substantive area um, moves away from housing. But on day one of their career, the moment they pass the bar, they are capable of um, making a difference through um, taking on pro bono cases, through participating in um, conversations about housing justice, um, and through, you know, advocacies and other avenues. Um, as well. Um, and so, you know, my goal, I see the, the clinic as having this real ripple effect and then the ripples sort of have been coming back towards me in my direction as well. And so that's been, it's been really wonderful to sometimes rely on um, uh, on students and refer um, potential clients. So we have a, some clients who aren't eligible for services in our clinic because they're not income eligible. Um, and I've referred them out to former students of mine. And that's been great. Well, that's amazing. I always uh, think that, you know, the success of a professor can sometimes be measured when the, the professor or the teacher becomes the student. And so it's great when you say that you now have former students that you can actually go to for uh, counsel and, um, and, and consult. So I, I think that's, yeah. that's amazing that, um, that you're able to It's about to, to happen, that. too, with, a, um, with Osceola, who is graduating soon. And I'm sure I will, you know, there'll be many times when I call him up for um, advice on various issues. 
And that's awesome, which actually I think that's a good segue um, that we are fortunate uh, to have an opportunity to talk to one of your former students. Uh, thank you for being with us today, Asiola Sankara. You are a soon to be graduate, is that correct? You're about to graduate from Howard Law School and the Fair Housing um, Clinic. Uh, uh, so that's exciting. I know that you are just thrilled to be able to have this as one of your accomplishments in your career. Um, before enrolling at Howard Law, though, you worked in Los Angeles organizing campaigns to raise equitable development and inclusive land use standards for the city. How did this influence your decision to attend Howard Law and work with the Fair Housing Clinic? Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. And um, my work in California was focused on equitable development. And I was a community organizer. I worked with local residents who were challenging gentrification and inequitable development patterns in their communities and were pushing back, were putting their own people-centered plans forward for how new housing should be constructed in the neighborhood and for how existing housing should be treated. And so the experience was, um, you know, it was a grassroots experience. I was working with uh, people who were themselves experiencing um, deteriorating housing conditions, who were dealing with you know, essentially slum lords, um, and who were fighting on that personal front uh, for fair housing and for um, safe housing in their own lives, and were also taking leadership positions in their own community to um, call for transformative policies that in the long run will lower the need for there to be these, um, you know, clinics that, that exist at Howard in the first place, right? Um, so that experience was really powerful for me because part of my job was developing the uh, residents as leaders and um, working with them to develop their skill set so that over the years as they would win these policy campaigns and as they would hold their own landlords accountable that they were building themselves up um, so that they could have an even more powerful impact in the future on future campaigns. So that experience for me uh, really put in focus the importance of skill development generally. And as an organizer, I felt for a while that I wanted to go back to school and develop myself as well and develop and increase my own toolbox, expand my toolbox. And I felt that having the experiences that I'd had working with grassroots community groups and working as an organizer I felt that those would be valuable skills to bring into a law school and uh, complementary skills that would work well with uh, legal training. And also having worked closely with attorneys um, as an organizer, it was really inspiring to see what we could accomplish when those disciplines were brought together and harnessed towards the same goal so looking at the possibility of going to law school, um, I felt that that presented an opportunity to you know, come in as, as a bridge builder, basically, as somebody who has this training as a community organizer and is um, committed to working as an attorney in the future with other community organizers uh, to fight for fair and just housing. Thank you, that's amazing. Uh, a primary goal of the Fair Housing Clinic is to develop the next generation, like yourself, of civil rights attorneys and advocates. How has your experience with the clinic impacted your career and educational endeavors? Dramatically. And to be clear, I came into the clinic confident, 100% certain, that I did not want to do litigation after I graduated. And so, and I remember telling uh, Professor Snyder this, you know, I, I went into the clinic almost as if I wanted to check that off of my list to experience what it felt like to litigate 
to be sure that, yes, this isn't what I want to do. Um, I felt like I wanted to do movement lawyering, transactional work. And so for me, the experience was uh, just a total 180 because I went in with that attitude and I left feeling like, oh, no, I definitely want to do litigation. Um, and, you know, part of the aversion for me was um, coming in, having experiences with the law that, um, you know, didn't feel as though, I didn't feel as though the courtroom was, you know, frequently conducive to just outcomes. Um, I had been a defendant in a case involving, you know, nonviolent civil disobedience. And after that, I felt like I never wanted to see the inside of a courtroom again. Um, but in the clinic, we were representing clients, we were representing renters, and we were working with them to challenge the totally, totally horrific situations that they were dealing with um, as a result of, you know, having really unscrupulous landlords. And in many cases, we were able to work with the clients and take their landlords to court and force them to, you know, in certain cases, invest uh, tens of thousands of dollars into um, abating code violations, you know, in, into getting rid of lead and getting rid of mold and repairing broken doors, installing new sinks, you know, fixing broken stoves, all of these things that are easy to take for granted. Um, if you're a person who doesn't have to think about turning on the stove and having it work or walking into your kitchen and having a fridge at all. So that experience really profoundly shifted the way I thought about litigation. And now having gone through the experience and, you know, getting ready to graduate in a week, I'm, you know, really committed to being a litigator after I graduate and continuing down this um, career and educational path that the Fair Housing Clinic um, has set me up for. Thank you. So where do you, uh, you're about to graduate, so just work with me for a second here. You're about to graduate from law school and the Fair Housing Clinic. It's five years. Where do you see yourself in these next five years? And in answering this question, do you see a future in fair housing law or other legal careers in public service? I think I might know the answer to this, but let me hear what you have to say. Absolutely. I plan on, well, first of all, I'm moving back to Los Angeles, which is you know, the city I called home for 10 years before I came to law school. And I absolutely will be um, working in public service and public interest. And uh, part of the work I'm going to be doing will be with grassroots community organizations that are working on fair housing law, that are working on all kinds of issues related to housing justice. And so that's really inspiring for me. And um, what I'm probably most excited about is working with groups that are doing all kinds of work across all kinds of silos. And I think that where we're at today in 2022, it's really clear that there's no way to kind of parse out these different issues, for example, to separate fair housing from access to transportation or to separate fair housing from good quality jobs and economic development in the community. Um, so I'm excited, I'm interested, I'm committed to within the next five years, doing as much work as I can with uh, local grassroots organizations that are bridging those divides and that are um, crafting innovative strategies for you know, how to achieve a future where uh, fair housing is no longer an issue for anybody. Yeah. In your opinion, how can institutions of higher education, specifically historically black colleges and universities or HBCUs, further develop the next generation of civil rights leaders and educators and fair housing practitioners? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that Howard does so much already I think that institutions like Howard, um, Howard itself, could build on you know, what they're already doing by um, a few things. One, I think really centering the uh, history and legacy and teaching that history and legacy when it comes to the civil rights movement and um, other liberation movements uh, based here in the United States. 
the, so many influential leaders from those movements uh, were produced by HBCUs. And so I think this is a legacy that schools like Howard are, are certainly proud of. And I think that um, one thing that could be done is, you know, making sure that when students are coming in their first year, they're aware of that legacy and how important it is to the institution. Um, two, more specifically around fair housing, I think that teaching um, what other disciplines are available and um, beneficial for attorneys to be to be working with. So, for example, there are so many developments occurring um, around technology, and um, I had a colleague that I was talking with a month ago who was sharing that um, he's working on a fair housing project, or excuse me, already developed it, um, a website that tenants could log on to, put in their address and see what other properties across the city are owned by that same landlord. And so it's a project that's trying to pierce the veil of limited liability corporations and all of these uh, things that sometimes property owners use um, to stymie tenants from holding them accountable. And um, so I think that's great. I think that's wonderful. And as somebody who just received three years of legal training, I know that's not something that I can do. You know, I sometimes can barely keep up with my email, much less create a website, right? Um, but those that's a discipline that could be so complementary uh, to what public interest attorneys, fair housing attorneys are doing. And I think that just giving students a general sense of what other disciplines are out there and how they can work with the um, legal practitioners to achieve the same goals. I, I think that that could be a powerful strategy as well. And then I think finally, just encouraging students to get involved with uh, local organizations, local activism while they're students, um, whether they participate in those efforts um, through a clinic or not. I, I think that that is a transformative experience that I know um, has been for me in my life and I think that's something that most students could benefit from. Thank you for that, Sankara. I'm going to ask this next question to you, Professor Dark, if you don't mind, um, that any of you all can uh, respond. Uh, and that is, as educators and advocates for fair housing and racial equity, what can we do at HUD to better engage the Howard University community and other college towns around the country, for instance? What can we do to better engage those institutions? Well, I'd like to start with, um, should I start with money? <laughs> because <laughs> let's talk about your funding arm uh, that makes it made it possible for us to establish the Fair Housing Clinic. And um, there could be others at other, many other places and other institutions. So I, I think that um, I want to encourage HUD to be uh, a little more proactive uh, in um, reaching out and, and suggesting that, that um, the need is great and the clinics can be created at law schools or in conjunction with other uh, community partners like nonprofits that are already doing the work fair housing groups that are doing the work and need more support, financial support uh, as well. I assume that you already are created, you have created some internship, externship opportunities, um, but that, that would be a good thing, not just for law students, but I wanna pick up on Sakara's point about crossing the silos and maybe including students from other fields in um, the work of HUD. Uh, and while you did not ask this question, I'm going to say it to answer a question about what direction should our fair housing clinic perhaps go in um, in the future. And here's a suggestion again, because our Sankara's just got his finger on the right point about the need to break these silos down. Housing does not, the problem around housing and discrimination in housing doesn't just exist in one field. Um, typically, uh, we're not, we need to think about ways to include those who are, who are doing environmental work, 
those who were doing work around health in the health science area, because there are health impacts here. Um, let's talk about, let's talk to the architects who are the doing using universal design to make it possible for accommodations, um, make it possible for those who need accommodations to be able to have a wider selection of housing choices. Uh, let's, let's engage the engineers. Let's engage the social workers. Hello, Sakara. I'm going to talk about that litigation now because they can help us help get victims to tell their story. Mm -hmm. They have a set of skills and tools to be able to help them get through some of these emotional um, barriers that can exist from when someone is discriminated against. It would be powerful to have social workers working with um, the attorneys on these cases. So that's when I'm if I, uh, future. I would see um, the housing clinic would look more like the entire university. Wow. Working together with working students together. in those fields. Absolutely, working together. Uh, so, Asiola, um, why do you think it's important for HUD to partner with HBCUs and other minority serving institutions? I heard Professor Dark's response, which I thought was just fantastic. But from your perspective, what, what are your thoughts on that? I think it creates an enormous opportunity for students to learn firsthand while they're students what it is that HUD does, why it's important, and make a case for a career in fair housing after they graduate. Um, I came into law school a little bit on the, the older side as far as, school, as far as students go, I'm 33 now. And so I was fortunate that I was coming in pretty much already knowing, uh, generally speaking, what I wanted to do. Uh, but I think a lot of students come to you know, law school, other professional schools straight out of undergrad, and they're still figuring out what it is um, that they can see themselves doing for the rest of their life after they graduate. And so I think HUD working with HBCs would create an enormous opportunity uh, for students to imagine what that would be like as a career after graduation. And uh, I think for uh, black and brown students in particular um, and other students coming from low income communities, you know, there's so many students at HBCUs who are personally impacted by the issues related to fair housing. And um, I think that HUD creating and strengthening those connections with these schools, with these students um, could be you know, a, a, a really, really important part of uh, creating that pipeline. Thank you for emphasizing that importance because you're absolutely correct. Um, I appreciate, I really appreciate your perspective on this. Um, I think that there's much work to do, but I think together we can get a lot of great things done. Um, are there any last thoughts that any of you all would like to briefly share with our audience before we end today's program? I don't have a, uh, I don't know if you would call the last thought, but I do have a quote that I hope would stick with folks. Um, and it's one that comes from the um, former president of the Children's Defense Fund, because I think that it's important to, to think about that your work, this work can be big and it can ha also be small and still have huge impacts. And the quote goes, so often we think we have to be a big dog in order to make a big difference. And that's simply not true. We just have to be little persistent pleas for justice. Enough pleas biting strategically can make the biggest dog uncomfortable. The dog of racism, the dog of sexism, the dog of discrimination and transform the biggest nation. We're sending students out to do that transformative work because we have a fair housing clinic. I don't even know if there's anything else that needs to be said. We're going after that dog, I promise you. We're all gonna go after that dog. Thank you all for joining us today at the table. 
I want to close this program with a final clip from Professor Dark's riveting documentary. Thank you, Professors Dark and Schneider and former student, or actually soon to be former student attorney, Osceola, for being with us today. And every time an individual is harmed by housing discrimination, so is the fabric of our society. One more blip, one more insult that the society has to somehow absorb because another member has been cut off or in some way been damaged in the society. All of us hurt. Discrimination is not a little matter. It's not just something that happens and you get over it, or it's not just something that happens and happens and you get used to it after a while. Who should get used to being degraded? If someone doesn't stand up, a lot of people stand up and say, enough's enough. You cannot withhold something as vital as housing from someone just because of the color of their skin, national origin, or whatever it might be. Then I think that uh, we're letting down all those other people who sacrificed for us, some of them who gave up their lives. And it was such a small thing for me to do in a way. Until our next Table Talk, remember, fair housing is more than just words. It's the law. Take care, everyone.